What I'm going to be covering today is a talk, as I mentioned, that I started last year called Activating the Domino Effect. And the idea with this is that you can uh, basically, people always ask me, how did I get to interview so-and-so or how did I get the endorsement for so-and-so? And so ultimately, what I'm going to show you guys and talk about today is how you can and why you should want to push the big domino over that lines up the rest. So where this comes from is Shailene or Shailene Johnson, if you've heard of her before, with uh, Turbo Jam, and she has the book called Push. Shailene uh, talks about in Push the idea if you can push your one goal, if you can figure out what's the one goal that if I get this goal, the rest will just fall into place. So she gave the example, if you write a book, become a best-selling author, that's also going to get you more clients, probably get you speaking gigs. So in other words, she can uh, take and tackle one goal. So she tackles one goal and it knocks a whole bunch of other goals down, if that makes sense. So I took the similar metaphor or analogy with dominoes, with the idea, if you can figure out what's the big domino I need to knock down, that'll take down all the rest of the dominoes, you're going to be able to leverage and make that so much easier. And so when people ask me how I've been able to do this and that, it's because I've been leveraging these dominoes. You know, I figured out what's the big one to push down. And then that one's allowed me to knock over the other ones much easier. So I'll give you an example, a real world example is my first interview on my podcast with a big name influencer was a guy named Jack Canfield. So a lot of you may have heard of Jack. Jack is the co-creator of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series of books. He was sold in excess of well 600 million books. So guy knows a thing or two about the book business. But at the time, Jack wasn't doing really any podcast interviews. He had, didn't have a book coming out. No reason to do a podcast interview. And here comes along this little uh, guy from Atlanta, Canada, me, uh, trying to get an interview with Jack Canfield. And so getting that interview with Jack was like a big domino, if that makes sense. So he was the big domino that if I could knock the, do the domino of Jack down, then that would allow me to go to, say, Mark Victor Hansen, Jack's writing partner, and say, hey, we had Jack on the show. We should get you on the show. Or I could go... Uh, yeah, as a speaking engagement, um, you know, on my bio, it can say, and he's also interviewed the likes of Jack Canfield. So that one domino, which by the way, was really hard to push over, knocked over other dominoes. So does that make sense? That's, I just want to give you guys the metaphor of what I'm going to talk about today. But uh, in this example with Jack, just to go further down that rabbit hole, it took about four months to get the interview. And that was four months of reaching out regularly. How I ultimately got the interview, if you want to talk about creativity, uh, how I got the interview ultimately was that I, um, I recognized that I needed to find somebody that Jack respected and have them recommend Jack for the show. And Jack's team said, look, he turns down nine out of every 10 interviews, Corey, so it's probably going to be a no. And so I said, how can I make that a yes? And so what I did was I heard about this guy named Dan Sullivan, who was Jack's coach. And I heard him being interviewed on Success Magazine's uh, CDs they used to send out. So uh, Success Magazine used to send out a CD you could listen to in your car. If people remember what CD players are. And uh, Darren Hardy, the publisher of Success Magazine at the time, was interviewing Dan Sullivan. Dan said it was one of his favorite interviews he'd ever done. My interview style was similar. So I reached out to Dan's team and said, hey, I'd love to have Dan on the show. We have a similar style to Success Magazine. And they said, oh, he loved that interview. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So Dan said yes. Now, again, he was Jack's coach. So I got Dan on the show, and he was a great guest to have on the show and added so much value. But what ultimately happened is I talked about Jack a few times, and Dan said, you know, Jack would love the show. You should get him on the show. So then I had an audio that I clipped, and I took that audio, and I sent it to Jack's team, and I said, look, even Jack's coach thinks Dan should be on our show. And they said the next morning, they came back, said, Cora, you've beaten us into submission. Jack's going to do the show. Let's schedule it. At the time, we had zero listeners on our podcast. We haven't even launched. And the idea of getting Jack on the show was pretty epic. My point, though, is it was a big domino. But once I knocked that one down, it was so much easier to then go to, like I say, Bob Proctor or Mark Victor Hansen and say, hey, we just had Jack on the show. We'd love to bring you on. And so I will say, uh, to finish off the story with Jack, just to put a nice bow on it, what's really cool about that story is after he did the interview with us, I was watching... Um, Larry King live and happened to notice Jack was on so he was on uh, Larry King live on a Friday we aired our show on Saturday we did the shows on Saturday and Sunday I happened to a friend said did you know that Jack he's you just aired him right and I said yeah he said he's on Super Soul Sunday right now so it ultimately ended up that Jack was on Larry King live on uh, Friday our tiny little baby show that just started on Saturday and then Super Soul Sunday on the own network on Sunday 
And so that's a kind of a cool ending because, you know, that, you know, that's how big that interview ended up being. And it did so much, right? It gained credibility for the show. People said, oh, well, Jack Canfield's been on it. It was good for leverage because we were able to put it in SEO and online and draw people based on the fact that Jack was on the show and so on and so forth. So hopefully that gives you a good explanation of the idea of if you can figure out what the big domino is for you and knock it over, the rest will start to fall. It just makes life that much easier. So how did I get started down this journey that I've been on for the last little while? Some of you may or may not have heard my story. There's a few people here I know that are that join us somewhat regularly. And of course, you would have heard my story, this story, part of my story a little bit uh, more than somebody else, maybe heard it a couple of times. But how I get started in this world that I'm in now, uh, outside of being in the corporate world previous to that, was that I actually uh, started in the world of stand-up comedy. So I basically, start, I wanted to, um, I had a stage play in a festival. I, I wrote a stage play, wrote and directed it, but I didn't want to be on a stage. I don't know if anybody here can relate to that, like terrified of being on a stage. But a lot of people say to me, oh, it must be so nice to be so comfortable on stages. And I always think if they only saw what it started like, because I certainly wasn't comfortable on stages when I started. I was the guy with the sweat coming down. In fact, for our upcoming speakers boot camp, for those that are coming to that next week, I'm actually trying to dig out either a video or an image of me with my long, thick hair when I had it and the sweat coming down my face, one of my early speaking engagements, just to demonstrate to you, it's not where you start that matters, it's what you do next. And so I was that person uh, as a speaker that wasn't comfortable on a stage. So I wrote this uh, play for this festival and I didn't want to be on the stage as the speaker. And so halfway through the play, one of the actors sprained his ankle and he was the lead actor. So the challenge is if you know stuff about the, um, that world, all of a sudden this person that was the lead actor now had a sprained ankle. He still did the rest of the shows, but he needed more time for costume changes. So I had to write a part in to give him more time. And now who do you think knows the lines to the play other than the actors? The only other person is the writer director who does not want to be on a stage. So I ended up forcing myself to be on a stage, but I wrote the part where I could have my back to the audience. And I came out with my back to the audience, still sweating, even though I wasn't even looking at the audience and uh, did the three days, the last three days of the play. And I asked one of the actors on the drive home, how do you think I can get over this fear? Because I feel like it's going to happen again. Like I'm going to be on a stage and I'm going to be terrified. So how can I get over it? He said, I don't know if this is the answer, but I'm going to a university workshop on stand-up comedy next week. Did you want to join me? And I said, that sounds absolutely terrifying. Let's do it. Because I felt that just uh, showing up for the workshop doesn't mean I'm ever going to get on a stage, right? I'm just, it could just be to learn more about writing, which I was already doing. So we did the workshop, two weeks of, here's how you adjust the mic stand. And then the guy kept telling us his favorite comic was awesome. And that was all our training to tackle what is likely the number one fear in the world above public speaking and above death, which is stand-up comedy. And so week number three, we went to a, a club where we did all the promotion, filled the whole club. And we were told that we were going to be the entertainer, we were going to be uh, watching comics and uh, doing a clinic afterward, talking about what we learned from these comics on the stage. Well, if you guys can see where this is headed, about five minutes to showtime, we were looking around saying, where are all these comics for the tonight? And the guy that did the workshop, his name was Guy, says, Corey, uh, guys, guess what? Good news. And then we said, well, where are the comics? What's the good news? Well, the good news is you guys are the comics. And so it was planned all along that we were supposed to perform that night, but none of us were told. So there were 15 that had paid for the workshop. I went into the bathroom to try to find an exit window to leave. And there was no exit window. And so I came back out and out of the 15 people that had paid for this workshop, eight had already walked in at the front door. They literally left. And so now there's seven left. And you guys can probably imagine what the new uh, discussion is. Who's going to go up first? So I had been to Toastmasters once. I had learned one thing at Toastmasters, which was if you're going to face a fear like this, go first. So I jumped up on stage. They're still debating. It's 10 minutes after showtime. Still debating who's going up first. I jumped up and I grabbed the mic. And I told what I felt was the best joke that I'd ever told in my life up until that point to dead silence. Now the streams of sweat are coming down my face and every, I'm, I'm like the deer in the headlights. So, but I already figured out, look, I'm already up here. It's the, I did the hard part. Let's just jump into the second joke. Maybe they didn't like the first joke. So I jumped into the second joke this time, not only dead silence, but tumbleweeds, I think went by the stage. It was just a mess. So what happened at that point is Guy, that guy that got us into this, called me over to the corner of the stage, gives me a schmuck in the back of the head, and he says, you idiot. 
what are you doing out there on the stage? We haven't even turned the mics on yet. And so I ultimately found out that when I first started on a comedy stage, my first two jokes, nobody could hear them because the mics weren't turned on. And so I used to finish there, but I've added in since people always ask me what happened after that. Well, what happened is we got the mics turned on. I told the jokes again, because we figured that's why the joke did, jokes didn't work. And this time they didn't laugh again. So I think I'm the only comedian in history to tell the same jokes twice in 10 minutes and bomb both times. And so not a great experience, but that's how I got started. Why do I open up with the story? It's because I want to demonstrate to you, it doesn't matter where you're at today, this stuff can all be learned. I had to learn it clearly. Like I was at the bottom of the barrel. And just to sandwich uh, what happened since that point is that was uh, 2002. I ended up performing week after week, ultimately performed about 700 shows over nine years. By the way, it took me about two years to get uh, more than 10 minutes of laughs at a show. And, but ultimately my last shows, one on the left on the screen is at the Improv in California. And the other one, excuse me, is at Second City, if you guys have heard of it. And I was performing at Second City as my last show I've ever performed. And the Improv was my second last. And this is from a guy who started and couldn't get a laugh on his first night. And I got to perform at two epic uh, venues as my last kind of retirement shows, if you will. And so again, what did I say earlier? It doesn't matter where you start, it's what you do next. So now I'm gonna jump into the meat of the presentation. My first question, and by the way, if you're putting questions or anything in the chats, I wanna let you know too, I'll be uh, checking that later as well. Um, so I just wanna let you know, I will be going through the questions if you put them in there and circling back. But my first question to you guys is, and feel free to comment in the um, chat if you want about this, but, and I see already one person did comment in the chat, uh, but does this photo establish credibility? And now I'll add the caveat when I ask this question, this is assuming that you are either a fan of or positive towards TEDx. So if you're a fan of TEDx, if you like TEDx, if you know of TEDx, the question is, does this photo add, add credibility? Now I'm asking you the question from your perspective, but I can tell you I've had the proof many times over that it absolutely does. Why do I say that? And how can you know, I demonstrate that? Whenever I go on a stage and somebody says, hey, our next speaker is a multiple time TEDx speaker, no matter what they say before or after that, I, I started noticing because I want to study this, the minute that people look over at me, whenever they hear my bio is when they hear he's a multiple time TEDx speaker, more than anything else. So I know that it adds credibility. Um, does this one add credibility? And I'm gonna dive into all this in a bit, but you know, does this one here, if you see somebody who's been featured on all these different media resources, does it add credibility? And then if you see somebody in the front of a magazine, does it add credibility? Now, again, I'm gonna explain why I'm putting these up there. It's definitely not a me ink thing. There is a reason behind the madness here. Um, and what I wanna talk about today relates to this. It relates to, uh, that domino I mentioned earlier to go back to that metaphor is when you can knock down those dominoes and start build, adding these credibility points, all of a sudden things get easier. You know, it gets easier to get on a big show whenever you can send them a magazine cover or the links to your TEDx talks. And so I wanna to talk to you guys about how you can get some of these things so you establish that kind of credibility. I'm also gonna give you one strategy that you can do starting today and do this within the next month and have one of these three things I showed you here, the credibility from that in less than a month's time. Some of the people that have joined me before have already, already know what I'm talking about or have already done this, but we'll get there soon. So let me ask you this, these questions first and foremost. Does this sound like you? You're going 90 miles an hour, but you still feel you're not impacting enough people. And, and of course, you know, feel free to either raise your hand, nod your head if you agree, uh, or put it in the comments, but I'm just curious. Uh, do you have a message that belongs on a big stage, whether it's TEDx or whatever stage that is? And would you like to be able to work where and when you want to? Meaning complete freedom, like lifestyle freedom, business freedom, what have you. Um, stick around to the end, not really a bonus, but I just wanna tell you about something at the end. Uh, but here's another kind of a chance for credibility. And before I leave this screen, I'll give you one, another instant tip that I wish I would have been told and wish I would have thought of early on is whenever you go to live events, make sure you bring your camera. So, and, and by the way, I should add, of course, let's be honest, I'd be naive to act like we don't all have cameras on our phones. But what I'm saying is make sure that if you see somebody that you would, uh, you feel would add credibility for you to be with or be on your website with or in a picture with, 
A, have your phone with you, so bring your phone with you, and B, get over the fear of asking them if you can grab a picture with them. And why I say this is because for me now, there's a, there's a kind of a bigger reason. I do a lot of interviews. And so the people on the screen, I've interviewed each one of them. And in some cases, we had to do the interview over the phone or now we're, you know, over Zoom because of COVID. But by being at the event and meeting them, if you see the photo of me and Jack and you're hearing, listen to the interview of me and Jack, even though if we never sat together in the past, which we had for interviews, but even if we hadn't, then I still have, you know what I mean? I still have the photo to leverage with that interview. But not only that, it's still on my website. It still adds all that extra credibility. And all you had to do was just be observant of who's at the event and be willing to ask, hey, can I grab a photo with you? So again, this is just a quick thing, but I would say, don't let this opportunity pass you by. And it sounds crazy because people think, well, you know, of course I, I wouldn't, but I see a lot of people standing there going, oh, I'd love to go over and talk to them, but I'm nervous. And all, all I'm going to tell you, is sometimes you never get that minute back if you don't get outside your comfort zone. So again, uh, when it comes to talking about how do you start establishing credibility quickly, one of, the, one of the easy ones is if you have photos with business celebrities or people that are known influencers, that's going to boost your credibility. And if you're going to events anyway, live events anyway, which I recommend you go to when you can, you know, again, it's easy. You just go to the book signing and say, hey, can I grab a photo? I've also learned as a side tip, see how in these pictures here, I have the tag on from the event I was at. I was actually speaking at the event, so it should have credibility, but at the same time, it looks like you're an attendee, so it doesn't look like you know the speaker and you just ask for a picture. So one thing I learned as well, if you're going up to the front to get a picture with them, take off the attendee thing. So just put that out there. I, I didn't think of it at the time. Uh, I know better now. Uh, but again, uh, if you can get to live events, and now, of course, with COVID, uh, I feel like live events are coming back and we're seeing that happen. So if you go to live events, see who's going to be there as speakers and see if you can get some photos because again, they will have credibility for you. Uh, but the other thing is what's great now with Zoom. If you're doing interviews with somebody, grab, make sure you grab some snapshots, your screenshots. And of course, if you're recording it, you don't have to worry about that because theoretically, as long as you don't lose the recording, you can always screenshot later. But if somebody else is recording an interview with you, grab a, a screenshot so that you have a picture with them. So just some quick tips. Uh, what you're going to learn here today is uh, basically four secrets around how to build influence and credibility. Uh, one of them, we talked about some of this already, but social proof, leverage, credibility, visibility, and how to get all that. Um, you're going to learn a strategy for landing a branded talk, like a TEDx talk. Uh, I mean, I don't have time to go. That, I'm doing um, at that boot camp, and I know some of you are registered. I can see Alicia here on the screen, and I know you're registered, Chris, I believe as well. Uh, at that boot camp, I'm going to actually go through my master class for landing your TEDx, like my whole master class. Obviously, I don't have a chance to do that today with a, an hour long session. So I'm just going to give you guys a couple of strategies that our students have used to land TEDx talks. I'm going to talk quickly about the power of books and how to leverage them and how to get some big name endorsements. Now, I'm going to. I was gonna show you guys a video, but for the sake of ease and time, because otherwise I'll have to minimize the screen and put this on YouTube. I know what the video is though. Um, so what I was gonna ask here, and I'll just tell you the story rather than put the video in, but um, Kelly Filardo, some of you may know in Alberta, who has worked with us. She's now a um, two-time TEDx speaker, a goal cast video with 10 million views. And I was interviewing Kelly recently for a thing we were doing, a launch we were doing for the Influencer Vault. And Kelly, actually, I'll correct this. She was interviewing me. And she um, said in the interview, which I did not know until that minute, she said that as a result of us helping her land her TEDx talks, helping her uh, with more bookings and all that kind of stuff, that for the first time in her life that year, she earned a six-figure income and was able to buy her kids every Christmas gift she wanted to buy them as a single mother for the first time in her life. And you know, the video is powerful because she says it through tears. And I didn't expect it. So I asked her later, can I use that video as a testimonial? But my point is, and again, it's easier for me to explain that than to try to put the video on the screen. I was thinking I'd be able to click right from here. But the reason I put it there, the why bother is because that's the reward, right? If you can get your message out to more people, which is not, it shouldn't be about you. It shouldn't be about the vanity side of it. It's that the more people you can get out your message to, the more lives you can impact. You know, so Kelly, we got the message out to her that we help people land TEDx talks and result is she was able to land some and then impact more lives. And then her, personally, it allowed her when she was getting bookings to get more speaking engagements and get paid more per engagement, which allowed her to earn six figures, which allowed her for the first time to buy every gift she wanted to for her children. So that's why Bob, the rewards that come from uh, just putting your message out and trying to create a positive ripple in the world. 
So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on my story because I told you a little bit about my background. Uh, but I will tell you, because again, it goes back to the idea of can anybody do this stuff? Well, first of all, you should never put a picture of yourself up like that in the screen. But it's the only picture I have of my mother and I back then. I have uh, some pictures now because I have two children and my mother finally has grandchildren. So we actually have pictures together now. But this was the only real one I had uh, from a long time ago. And I was 16. And you should never show people a picture of like that with that mustache and that gem of a hair piece. But um, but that was me at 16. And how it relates to my mother is I grew up in a small little town, raised by a single mother, barely graduated high school. When I did graduate, didn't know the difference between fiction and nonfiction, which is kind of ironic, years later writing books. In fact, I told my mother I wanted to write a book and she said, well, I think you have to read one first. And so I did. And then I wrote my first book. Uh, but I didn't know the difference between fiction and nonfiction. Again, hadn't read a book. Uh, my first book I ever read was at age 27. You may have heard of it. Uh, it's a book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Uh, second book I ever read was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And I've often said, if you're going to start uh, late, start with those two books. You know, if I, I might have started late, but I was already ahead of people that didn't discover those books for 10 years, you know, 10 years after me. So um, I did start late in terms of reading books. And uh, I barely graduated high school. As I mentioned, I had uh, one of my teachers gave me a 49 plus one. And I needed 50%. So he literally reminded me and stamped it on me for the rest of my life that I never probably legally graduated high school because he gave me the plus one. So that tells me I was probably at like 47 percent and he put it up to 49 and then gave me the plus one i find it hard to believe i land at rate of 49 that would be too coincidental so my point is i probably didn't sort of technically graduate high school even though i have a diploma that said i did so the point of that is if you can grow up in a small town obviously adding in the raised by a single mother to point out that we didn't have a lot of money i had to borrow to go to college like borrow money to go to college and so it wasn't easy I wasn't written up in my yearbook as likely to succeed let alone most likely and so all of this stuff it's very doable regardless of where you start. It goes back to what I said earlier. doesn't matter where you start. It's a common theme. doesn't matter where you start. It's what you do next. So diving into this idea of credibility and visibility. So let me ask you this question. If, and again, you can put the comments in the chat if you want uh, your thoughts on this, but I'll ask you this question. If you were, uh, if the town you're living in had two dentists that were both, let's say for argument's sake, we're across the street from each other. And one of the dentists wrote a book about dentistry and was on the local news and you saw him doing interviews and he had a column in the local newspaper and the other dentist didn't have any of that. And, you know, you just knew who they were by driving by their, their uh, shop, if you will. And everything was equal, meaning the price was the same. You could get in to see that dentist that wrote the book on it and everything else. Who do you think most people will go see, even though they probably have the same skill level? You don't have to answer this in the chat if you want, you can, but I would argue that most people will go see the quote unquote celebrity dentist. And to back that up, I know um, a guy, his name is Fred Connor, who lives in Nova Scotia in Canada. And Fred was on the TV show, What Not to Wear, uh, X-Weighted, and another TV show as the self-esteem, I think it was ambassador or something like that. And, but Fred's a hairstylist based in Nova Scotia. So at the time, Fred had a place called Just Fred, which is called Fred. And at the time, he told me that it was about 18 months to get in for a men's haircut. And a men's haircut for him, with him, was $90. So as a guy who doesn't have to get haircuts anymore, but as a guy who had to get haircuts back then, I can tell you a guy's cut was normally less than 20. And I could get in within a week or less. Sometimes I could walk right in, but not with Fred. So what I'm getting at is Fred had a line basically out the door. I don't mean the literal line. I mean, but he, you couldn't get in. And the only difference between Fred, and he would tell you this, he probably wasn't, there was other stylists that were winning awards at the competitions that he wasn't winning. And he didn't go to, to a salon school, which I don't think he can even get away with now. He didn't go to cosmetology school. But the point is, because he was a celebrity, he was getting paid, what, six times the amount of money and people willing to wait that long just to say they had their haircut with Fred and get a picture with him. So again, the same applies to the celebrity dentist. I'm only saying this to demonstrate the power of this kind of credibility. And so social proof and visibility. I told you guys I was going to give you a strategy. If you leave with nothing else today, this is the strategy you should pay attention to because this is a strategy you can walk away and apply right away regardless of where you are starting right now. Uh, have you guys ever heard of this, the As Seen On banner? Like if you ever went to a celebrity website or a business leader website and it says as seen on Oprah and Forbes and entrepreneur and what have you, um, 
you'll find that if you go to Tony Robbins website right now, it's probably on there. I know if you go to Jack Canfield's website, it's on there. If you go to Lisa Nichols website, I think it's on there, meaning they all have a banner. So if people like Tony Robbins, who only has limited space and basically has more bookings that he could ever handle, still feels it's important to have an as seen on banner on his website. Do you think they add credibility? I mean, he would have studied this, right? He knows the science behind this. And so the answer is they do to the point where I've heard numbers as high as 70%, meaning increase your credibility up to 70% higher if you have an as seen on banner. But the interesting part is most people don't have one. Most influencers, most people that are authors, most people that are healers, coaches don't have one. And I feel like, because I've asked people this, what they usually tell me it's because, well, I, don't, I have an interview. I haven't been on Oprah. I haven't been on the show. I haven't been on that show. And I think the problem with that is they see it on the big influencer site and that they were on whatever show it is. And they think I have to have been on that one. But you don't. And the good news is, because we're in a world now where there's one point something million podcasts in the world, guess what that means? Most people don't know who the big media is anymore. They know the ones that they've always known. But you know, if I were to uh, survey people here and look at mine right now, if I said, who's Connect TV, I would say there's quite a few people on here that wouldn't know. If I said, who's Evan Carmichael? There's some that would, there's some that wouldn't know. If I said C-Suite Network, probably less people would know. But the point is, I'm still putting them on there with all the other ones. And interestingly enough, the cool part about that is you can be on 10 or 15 random podcasts that people don't necessarily know if they're a big show or not, but the average person that's thinking of hiring you as a healer will still go, wow, the media vetted them. Does that make sense? And so I said, I mean, so first of all, I want to tell you and make the case for why you should have an as on banner, but then I want to go one step further and I want to say how you can get one really quickly and easily. So I think you should have an as on banner. Every person on here should have an as on banner somewhere. Um, and I think you should use that stuff, meaning like the as seen on, uh, even if you don't have the banner, you should use that on your email. You should have that on your social media. Uh, just leverage this because it's you can get on one interview that somebody might never listen to and still get the benefits of uh, the logo and the fact that you were on there. And in fact, a lot of times uh, you'll be on somewhere that almost nobody has seen, but yet you've gained the credibility over and over again because of the logo or because of the photo of you on that media. So here's an easy way to do this. I don't know if I have it on my next screen, so I'll check before I, yeah, I do. Okay, good. Uh, so here's an easy way to get an as seen on banner done within less than a month for $0. And I'll say the caveat is maybe $20 if you don't know how to design the banner. So zero to $20, what I'm about to share. So what you can do is you can get on podcasts. So you can get a, a podcast interview. And uh, if you get a podcast interview, get their logo. And all of a sudden that becomes one towards your 10 for your as seen on banner. So I'm going to give you some resources for how you can get those podcast logos easily. One of them, and this is the easiest one, in my opinion, radioguestlist.com. So you can see on the screen, I have Radio Guest List, radioguestlist.com. If you go there right now, the top right-hand corner, you'll see a place where you can sign up for their email newsletter. And if you sign up for the email newsletter for free, every day, starting tomorrow, you'll get an email that says, here's whatever number, five podcasters looking for guests for their show. And if you apply for every one of those, my guess is you'll at least get one out of five, even if you're just starting. And so you get on one out of every five, uh, podcast. I'm saying this is the low, low number, low case scenario. But let's say you did that for two business weeks. So Monday to Friday, two weeks. And so you applied for five, you land at one. What does that mean? At the end of two weeks, you now have 10 interviews on podcasts. Now, I don't have to go into all the details of the fact that now you have a podcast interview you can share forever. You now have the credibility of being on those shows. You now get to be on the shows and have listeners discover you. Oh, and you could send people to a landing page where you get their email address. You have all the other benefits from being on that show. But then you also say, hey, can I get a copy of your logo? I want to put it on my as seen on banner. Every person's going to say yes because they want their logo promoted. So what happens then, you can probably get on those shows I mentioned within about a week and a half of landing the gig. So that means in another week and a half, so two weeks to get the shows, which you might even be doing some of the interviews while you're still getting them. But let's just take worst case scenario, two weeks to land them, and then it takes a week and a half to do the interviews. I'm saying now at the end of a month, that's where my month comes in. At the end of the month, you can have 10 logos. And you now can put them on an as seen on banner that can go on your website or on your social media or wherever you want to put. The other uh, resource I put here, in interview guest directory is another one like radio guest list. Uh, Apple 100, what that re uh, relates to is you can go on Apple, of course, and search the top podcast and reach out to them. In most cases, you'll have to do a bit more research to find who, it, who the per contact person is. 
listennotes.com, uh, which is where you can search up podcasts and find out their rankings. Uh, podcast guest collaboration community. There's a Facebook group with about 20,000 podcasters that are looking for guests that you can go on there. That one's a lot more competitive, which is why I recommend it radio guest list first. But message here is, if you go to any of those or all of those, you should be able to get 10 interview spots fairly quickly, given that there's a million and some podcasts podcast right now looking for guests. So having said that, that's your first, if, you, if there's homework from today, that's your first piece of homework, which is take action on that. Sign up at radioguestlist.com, start getting the requests that they're looking for guests, apply to be on the shows, get the logos. Now you might already have some interviews done. You just might have to get the logo, but if you don't, I'm saying if you're starting from scratch, get the logos. And then if you can design the banner yourself, that everything I just told you costs you zero dollars and zero cents. Now, if you're not a designer, what you can do is you can go onto the freelance sites like Radio Guest, or sorry, Radio Guest, like Upwork or Fiverr or 99design. Post the job, say you're looking for a banner, and you're probably going to get that banner done for less than twenty dollars. So, can you see how having that banner could increase your credibility? And again, I'm going to continue through, but if you have questions, please feel free to post them in the chat. But that's one thing I wanted to immediately say, here's something you can do starting tomorrow. Now, I'll go one step further and say, here's the way I recommend not to do it. And I would probably get some flack from some people that I'm even connected with for saying this. But And feel free to, again, put your hand up in this or post in the comments. But how many people here have been approached by a press release service? It says we can release, uh, we can do a press release for you and send it out to all the media. And then you can say you were featured on. So you can say you're featured on CBS, NBC, because we've sent your press release for $250 out to all those places. So if you've had that experience, again, I'm not the boss of you, so you can do as you wish. Uh, but I've done this in the past and I, I did it on purpose because I wanted to learn from the experience to see if it was worth doing. What I want you to know is. Ultimately, when you take advantage of a service like this, you have to be able to sleep at night. You have to understand that when you say you're featured on NBC, what you're actually featured on is they, they basically work with NBC affiliates and they get a backlink to where your thing is positioned. It's not on the front of NBC. It's not really on NBC's website. They create a backlink that your press release is now on for a limited amount of time. Like in other words, you could share it for a month and, and six weeks later, people go there and it's a dead link. So what they're doing is they're kind of saying you were on NBC because you were technically in the back end of NBC's affiliates, if that makes sense. And so you have to question if you're okay with that. But why I bring this up is because it can get costly. So I had, I won't say who it is, but I had a press release service reach out to me last week and they said, we're just looking for a thousand dollars and we guarantee you ad placements and 10,000 impressions. And I said, well, you know, I've been doing media a long time and I'm not really in the market for, for impressions. I want engagement. So I said, um, is this one of the services where you're sending it out and I'm not really, I'm, I'm basically on a backlink page. It's going to disappear at some point. And I went through what I just told you. And he said, yeah, he said, based on what you just told me, this isn't a fit for you. And so they're really looking for people that are willing to pay to be able to say they were been on certain media. Now, again, technically you could still say you're on that media. So it's not, my, I'm not the judge of you and I'm not saying it's bad that anybody do, does this or has done it, but it is something that you're going to get approached by at some point. And I just want you to be aware of it. And it is a pay to play where you're paying. They'll ask you for some details. Then they're going to just send a random press release out to the places that they have these agreements with. And those places are going to put a thing up on you in the back website. The downside too, is that usually when a person goes to read it, it doesn't look like a real news article. You can almost tell. It's something that's different, if that makes sense. And so I just want you to be weary of it and realize that the people like, you know, the insert name here, but the, the top influencers that you're seeing, uh, like the Gary V's, the Tony Robbins, the Marion Williamson's, they're not using those services. Now, did they ever at the beginning? I can't say for sure or not. But what I'm saying is when you're seeing them in, in a lot of places, they're actually being approached by those places. And so I just want you to know it is a thing that you could jump into, but I just want you to realize that you have to be okay with the fact that you're not really in those media. Is that fair? Like to be on, that honest about it and blunt about it? But again, it's a service that exists and people are paying for it every day. 
So I'm again, not to boss you. I just want you to understand that when you see people and they have the as seen on by the side of their face, some, there's some cases they've never actually been on any of those outlets. They're getting the credibility, but you know, again, it's because of how it was all structured on the back end. So, you know, that's on the social proof side. So again, I only really wanted you to have one big takeaway from that because I don't want, I figure if I send you too much stuff, if I send you too many places and teach too much stuff, then you're probably not going to tackle any of it. So I just wanted to cover that one big thing, which is the power of logos and you being able to say that you were featured and really uh, interviewed and or appeared on certain media. But I also want you to know it's so much easier to do now with podcasts. The competition is so much more fierce and there's so many more outlets that you can be on a lot smaller platforms, get on them a lot easier and quicker and still leverage that. And you legit were on that podcast. So, and again, you get all the benefits of being on the podcast as well. So that was kind of a double whammy. You got the resources for how to get those interviews and also how to do an as seen on band. Second thing I wanted to talk about was landing a branded talk, which would be like a TEDx or a goal cast or something similar. I'm going to give you guys one of the keys, well, not one of the key strategies, but a strategy that some of our students have used for landing their branded talk. This one is not kind of the, there's a couple that are like the, the secret sweet sauce, but they take a lot longer to explain. Uh, but this one has landed, I mentioned Kelly Falardo. This was how she landed her first TEDx talk in four hours uh, signing up for our program, this exact strategy. So what the strategy is, is going out to your community and letting them know you wanna do a TEDx talk. And so what we got Kelly to do, she was coming to me with a topic that she wanted to share on a stage and said, what are your thoughts? And I said, I think it might be too risky and controversial and it might not fit you and your brand. So I said, if I were you, I would put it out to your audience and ask them what they think. And at the same time, mention you, you'd love to do the, a TEDx talk around this. What are people's thoughts? So she posted that on her social media. She got a ton of feedback, a ton of thoughts on it. By the way, maybe, well, you don't know the topic. So I'll just say, uh, maybe not surprisingly, overwhelmingly, they said, this isn't your brand. I don't think this is a good idea for you. So then she came up with a second idea and said, what about this one? This is the other talk I was thinking of doing. And when that one went up, a lady private messaged her and said, Kelly, I didn't know you wanted to do a TEDx talk. I just started running. I have a license. I just started running a TEDx event. You're in. Based on that talk you just put up there, you're in. So what she did is she got feedback on her talk. And then also, all of a sudden, you think about all the people you have in your network. You're usually only one degree away. She was able to let them know she's looking without begging for it, but let them know she, she's looking so that if there's anybody in her sphere at all that's connected to somebody, all of a sudden now there's a fairly good chance they're going to actually think about, hey, would she be a good fit for our event? And so you're putting it out to the world and the universe, but at the same time, like I said, maybe just as important, you're getting feedback on whether or not it's a goosebumps talk anyway. So you get to know if it would be a good talk for a TEDx stage. And also uh, you're getting, again, that feedback from everybody else. Now, having said that, I will also add that um, when you put it out there like this, you got to be comfortable with that. Some people struggle because like, I don't want to tell everybody my great talk because somebody will steal it. And my answer to that is Kelly's talk was called Ugly is Still Beautiful. And it was a talk about how she was bullied when she was younger. She was burned at age two. Uh, so she scarred at a certain percentage of her body. And the talk was about how she discovered she's still beautiful. So what I'm saying is who else is going to be able to steal her talk from her and deliver it the same way with her message? So again, I would actually, and I would go so far as to say, make sure your talk is so authentic to you that it's hard for people to steal it in the first place. And then you could be comfortable putting it out there. But she's one example. We have another person who was a, was a LinkedIn influencer. She was struggling to land a TEDx talk. I said, look, you have 20 some thousand followers on LinkedIn. Just put it out there. And she did the same thing and said, here's my idea. And she landed her TEDx talk, delivered it about, I think about 14 months ago. Same idea. And so it's, it seems like a very basic strategy. But what you're doing is you're tapping into this big network you have and letting them know and putting them on notice. The other thing I would share uh, around TEDx is another sort of, I'll, 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 I can't go far, far into this one, but I'll tell you the premise is you need to figure out who the organizers are. So every TEDx event has organizers. And if you're not on their radar and if they don't know who you are, then you're just another ap application coming across. You're just competing with, if they have 2000 applicants and they only know four people, guess what? If you're one of the ones they don't know, you're just one of the other 2,000 applicants. And if you set it in and you just went on the TEDx website and submitted your application form and you come in and they don't know who you are and you came in at number 1,995, 
is it fair to say they're probably so tired of looking at applications that they may not look at yours that closely unless something really jumps in? So your odds, you wonder why so many people say I applied 30 times and I never got the talk. I would argue it's because they've never been front and center and got to build a relationship with the people that are actually bringing the speakers in. And I don't have time to go into it fully, but what I can tell you is there's very creative ways to research and find out who the organizers are and get on their radar and actually be talking with them to the point where they still aren't seeing it as you're just trying to get a TEDx talk from you. And this is one of the strategies we teach people that increases the odds by like an extra 50% of them landing their talk. It's really powerful. So again, I don't have time to go into all of it, but even if you just take that away and say, okay, if I can just find out who the organizers are and reach a couple of them or get on their radar. And in this case here, if I can just put it out to the world and let people in my network know, I'd love to do a TEDx talk. Even those two quick strategies will increase your odds by, and I don't know the exact percentage, but increase your odds dramatically over just submitting it across you know, an uh, email and saying, good luck, hope for the best. So those are a couple of quick strategies. And the one other thing I want to tell you about, because this relates to whether you're delivering your TEDx talk or delivering any talk on a stage, or even it could be writing in a book. Uh, but one of the things I often talk about is uh, content is king. Have we all heard that before? The idea that content is king. So content is so important. It's crucial. It's almost everything. We've all heard that. But I would argue and add that emotional connection is queen and the queen rules every castle. Women are responsible for like 95% of all purchasing decisions in the household. So the queen really rules the castle. But what I'm really going at here is I'm saying when you're delivering a talk and especially a TEDx, but any talk, you need to have great content. But more importantly, you have to know how to connect with the audience. I'll just leave you with this thought on this subject. If you had the choice of watching a speaker who had a great message and was kind of brilliant and sharing it, but was so boring that you watched other people around you yawning, or you had somebody who had a decent message, maybe good message, but not brilliant, but they were so dynamic, people couldn't take their eyes off them. Which speaker would you rather watch? You can comment, you can put it in there. My experience in surveying people over and over again, the majority of people would rather watch the dynamic speaker. That's the emotional connection part. And emotional connection could just be asking the audience a question. How many people would try stand-up comedy if I could get you a gig tonight? Just ask that question. It connects, I see a hand going up. Just that question gets you an emotional connection to the audience. So what I'm suggesting is find it a way to connect emotionally with the audience and have good content. If you have both of those, you're already ahead of 90% of the speakers in the world. And I, that's a bold statement. But I would argue that, I mean, there's a lot of speakers that go up and read from, you know, read from a page or speakers that go up and have a thousand bullet points on each page. So when you take all those speakers out, think about the few that you see, and they're the ones you usually hear about all the time that are actually working a stage where they're walking, they're engaging with the audience. They're, you look at them and go, wow, they have so much charisma. And then also they have a way of sharing their message that you've never heard before. That's a small percentage. So if you can figure out how to do both of those, you're already ahead of a lot of speakers. And it's not as hard as people make it. Again, it can be simple as being willing to ask questions throughout your talk. will get you engaged with the audience and they'll get them listening because they're like, oh, I was asked a question. Again, I had a hand up. I can only see a couple of faces. I had one hand up, two faces put their hand up when I asked about how many people would try stand up. So that's engagement right there. And then of course the content side, I mean, that's a, for a whole nother day. I will say though, and again, it's not meant to be another sort of cheap plug for the upcoming boot camp, but I'm going to be going heavily into how to create that world-class content as well. Um, so that's around the side of branded talks. Third thing I wanted to talk about today is books. And I won't spend a whole lot of time on here, but I will just say this. Next to TEDx talks, I feel right now books is the second biggest credibility builder. Like having a book, being a best-selling author is still super creditable. At one point, I would say it was above TEDx talks, but what I see now, I think it's probably either close or TEDx might lead it out a little bit, but books is still in the running. I would say the three best ways to build credibility is to get media appearances, have a book, and, uh, and be the author on a certain subject, and uh, do a branded talk like a TEDx or a Goldcast or a Mindvalley. So even one of those is going to take you to the next level. And of course, you can do your own book like this here, which gives you even more credibility. Um, but at the same time, don't discount a compilation book, which you still get credibility for. You're still an international best-selling author. Uh, so we do compilation books like this is our Blue Talks, but there's lots of people doing anthology or compilation books. I would say that if you haven't written a full book by yourself now, get in a compilation book because you get all the benefits. You get to become a best-selling author usually. 
you get to meet the, all these other great people that you can network with and become clients or uh, suppliers to down the road. Like they could become business relationships. Uh, also, you get to learn. This is, I think, the biggest thing people miss when they go into a compilation book. You get to learn the whole book business for some, from somebody else. You don't have to spend $10,000 learning the book business. You can learn it while you're watching somebody else bring the book together. So when we do this, you can watch our whole system as we're doing it. And you can learn the whole system. Uh, so much so that you can even, I mean, and I don't hide the stuff, but you can reach out to me and say, hey, who's your contact as an editor? Who's the contact as a formatter? But you could, and, and I mean, now to put together a book, I can do a book for under $1,000 now. And it used to be, probably cost me 7000 but now I found the right people. I found the people to work with that no, I know do a great job and their pricing is really reasonable. So what I'm saying is you could go in a compilation book and find out who they used and save money. So don't discount a compilation book. And at the same time, if, you, if it's taken you a long time to get your own book done, a compilation is a great secondary option because when you go in a compilation book, you could become a best-selling author um, and all those other things I said. But then the other thing I find is it makes you want to write your book sooner and it makes you get it done sooner. So my first book was a compilation book 10 years ago called Share Your Message with the World. For five years before that, I kept saying, I'm going to write a book soon, going to release a book. Never happened. Wrote uh, in the Share Your Message book. Less than four months later, my book was on shelves. And again, the only thing that changed is I got to see the book business firsthand and realize it wasn't as big as I was making it. So again, when we talk about books, whether it's a compilation book or your own book, books add a huge amount of credibility. And so I would say, if you don't have a book written now, you should put the effort toward it. Uh, at the same time, I also want you to realize you don't have to be that person that sits in your room and writes all day, every day to have a book out because now the world we're in, you can, tr you can um, transcribe it. You can talk it into your phone if you're not a writer and send it to somebody and get them to transcribe it into a book. You, uh, one of the things, Lisa Nichols, if you guys know who she is, Lisa Nichols is dyslexic. She wrote two New York Times bestselling books and uh, basically was the main compiler of Chicken Soup for the African-American Soul. And I asked her, Lisa, how did you write two full books and being dyslexic? She said at first she took, she took the money as advances to write the books, only to realize that after trying for a while, it wasn't going to happen. And she said she had planned, if she had to, she was going to give the money back. So, you know, that's pretty wild. She was going to give the money back. So she put it in a separate account. But she said she finally, finally realized that, wait a minute, I'm a good interview. What if I hire somebody to interview me? We get some really cool backdrop. So then she can use that video and, and stuff forever. She can make a course out of it and she can get her books written that way. So just interview each interview being a chapter, for example. But the takeaway from you from there is there's so many other ways to get a book done outside of just having to sit down and write it. If you're a writer, if you love to sit down and writing it, that works. But if you're not, now there's so many low cost ways to actually talk your book to life and send it to somebody else and have them transcribe it and then get somebody else to edit what was transcribed and then get somebody else to format it. But I'm just making the case that a book is gonna add a level of credibility. If you don't already have a book, it's gonna add a level of credibility that you haven't experienced yet and it can change everything. So making the case for books. Also, a lot of people discount the idea of having a book as a business, meaning leveraging your book for your business. So what a lot of people don't realize is a large percentage of business authors they actually put a book out to build, build, use it to build their business. It's their funnel. If you're familiar with the term funnel, they use it as their funnel to bring clients in. And so John Lee Dumas, who has Entrepreneurs on Fire, he put out a book about podcasting early on. And he leveraged that book into webinars, meaning he added at the front, hey, you want to sign up for our free webinar? And the people signed up for the webinar, he then launched a thing called Podcaster's Paradise. Well, Podcaster's Paradise, I think, last I heard, I think it's around $2,000 a year. And he has over 2,500 members. So you can do some quick math and realize that all came on the back of his book. He leveraged his book to grow a pretty decent, solid business. But I can go one step further and say, do you guys know ClickFunnels, who Russell Brunson is? Anybody know who that is? He write, he's the ClickFunnels. Okay, so I see a couple of hands. So Russell Brunson is ClickFunnels. And it's, a, it's a basically a um, platform like Kajabi or any other ones you might be familiar with or, or um, Kartra or anything like that. And basically, uh, it, it helps you manage your funnels. And so what he's done is he has a book, he has three books, but let's say his book.com secrets, he actually sells it using Facebook ads with free plus shipping, if you've heard of that before. So you click on a Facebook ad, hey, get my book for free, you just have to pay the shipping. And then once you get into that funnel, you basically sign up for the book, it kicks you to another page, 
that says, hey, did you want us to get the free, or do you want to buy the audiobook for 35 bucks? And if you say no or yes, then it kicks you to a page that, hey, you want to join ClickFunnels? So he, he actually gets a percentage of people sign up there, but even the ones that don't end up being on his email list that he can then market to going forward. Anyway, he has said, I've heard numbers as high as $200 million a year ClickFunnels has done on the back of a book. So I just want you to realize that there's a lot of people that are using books to build a business. Last one is, and I think some of the people here were on the call yesterday with Chandler Bolt that I had. Uh, Chandler Bolt, we shared it. I don't know if we shared it in this bio or if it was in an email I sent out, but Chandler uh, built his business to $8 million a year. I think last year was $8 million. And he would sit here and tell you his biggest funnel was his book. So the book was the biggest reason he was able to build a, a basically, what is that, an eight-figure business? And a yearly, and all on the back of a book. So again, I know a lot of people think of, I just need to get a book out and it'll build my credibility. But I want you to know there's a lot of other ways you can leverage a book. And <clears throat> excuse me, I could go on and on about people who have done that, like Robert Kiyosaki with Rich Dad Poor Dad. I think the book sales now are 40 million copies. Yet he's the first person to tell you it's the best business card he's ever built. He used it as to get indoors, open doors. So again, uh, when it comes to that domino effect, I talked about earlier, you can push over those big dominoes. Well, uh, one of them could be writing a book. Another one could be going that next step and saying, I'm going to write a book that's built around a certain specific business. And I'm going to use that book to draw people into my business. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this because I think a lot of people here probably know that self-publishing now. And again, if you were on Chandler's yesterday, I think he said something, I think his percentage was he thinks for 99.7% of the people in the world, self-publishing makes the most sense. Now, I'm with two traditional publishers. I have a book. I'm represented by Simon & Schuster with a compilation book. And the book I showed you of mine is with Morgan James Publishing, both traditional publishers. I also have multiple books that are self-published. And all I'm going to say to, to tell you which one a person should go to is it's going to come. It always depends. So it's going to come down to this. Do you need massive distribution for your book that you can't get on your own? And what I mean by that is if you have a book like The Four Agreements or Alchemist or Celestine Prophecy, which needs to reach that kind of audience and can only do it through bookstores, for you to do that as a self-published author is going to take so much time and work and never going to be as successful that you're going to regret that you did it, if that's your only goal. But for most of the people that have businesses, most of the people that want to get their message out in the world, self-publishing works better because you can get your book out quicker. You don't have to remove everything that the publisher doesn't like. You keep control of your book so you don't lose the ownership of it. Uh, you can trans uh, transpose it into, say, audiobook, and you still own those rights. You can sell it. Uh, if it was a movie, if it was good enough to be a movie, you could sell it and keep those rights. Also, um, and I think this is you know, a big one, time to market. If you go with a publisher, my, our book, that one I showed you on the screen, was self-published first. So it was already ready to be released to the market. The covers look almost the same, and I had to wait another almost two years before my book could be sold again to a person. And so what I'm getting at as well is it takes time. If you have self-published book, honestly, uh, if you, you know, if you had the book, if you could write the book in 30 days and have a quality book, you could have it in the market in 31 days. So in other words, you can work as quick as you need to. The other thing is one of the obstacles used to be affording the book. So ordering your own copies, but now with print on demand, like Ingram spark and, and Amazon and stuff like that, you can literally buy one book and print it for less than we used to be able to buy a thousand or 5,000 books per copy. You know, so I can buy uh, certain books that I put out for $5 on Amazon to order one copy. And back in the day, in my first books, I'd have to order 5,000 copies to get them down to that price. So all, for all those reasons, I think unless you have a book that needs to reach a massive audience, and, I, and when I say needs to, I mean just because that's the topic, and it just needs to do that, then I would say self-publishing for most people would be the better route. Because the other side is, the time it takes to get the market doesn't include a time it takes you to land a publisher. And publishers are more picky than ever before. One of the things Chandler said at the front of his book, and it's, I've been in the book business a long time, and I never thought about this until I read it. But he said, a lot of people don't realize the top book publishers. Uh, yeah, uh, Chris is showing his book on the screen, by the way, published. Uh, he says right in that book, Chris, a lot of the people don't realize that the big book publishers like uh, Random House and HarperCollins, and by the way, I found out something new the other day. Most of them have all been bought by a German company, but they still run with separate headers. Um, those companies, their investment, they're basically venture investors. And what he co commented on is typically speaking out of 10 books that get released by them, four or five lose money, one or two or three break even, 
and one makes money. So in other words, they can lose money on those nine to make money in the one. So if they already know they're going to lose money on books they think are going to make money, then you can imagine how hard it's going to be for you to convince them that you have a book that's going to make the money because they already thought those other ones are going to do it and they weren't even right. So I just want to point out that it's also going to be hard to get a publisher unless, here's the caveat, unless you have a big following or a big email newsletter list. And I wanted to mention this repurposing content. One of the things I see is so many people now are constantly every day trying to create new content, running at a time, uh, overly busy, overwhelmed all the time. If you're familiar with Brendan Burchard, uh, I, I heard an interview with Brendan one time talking about how he formats his week. What he does is at the beginning of the week, his team records a one hour video with him. And in that one hour video, he might say, I'm gonna teach five tips. And so what they do then is that his team takes that and they turn it into image quotes, this one interview, they turn it into short videos, they run the full video, they turn it into the audio for a podcast. And you see where I'm going with this, right? They basically take that one hour that Brendan spent and they turn it into a week's worth of content that he never has to look at. He just spent the one hour on video. And if you think about a guy as busy as Brendan is, one hour is massive. So I just wanted to put it out there that you don't always have to start content from scratch. Now, and I know I'm right down to the, to the wire here, uh, but I just have this one more quick, uh, quick part to go through. And then I'm just going to open it up for Q&A. Like I said, um, I wanted to stay close to an hour. I thought it might be about 10 minutes sooner than it was coming through it, but uh, you know, happy to answer questions as well. So any questions, feel free to put them in the comments and, uh, and I'll, you know, I'll stick around for questions, uh, of course. So the last part is I get asked this all the time. How do I secure a big name endorsement or how do I secure a big name interview? Or for example, in this case, I have James Redfield on the screen who wrote Celestine. And you may have saw when I showed my book earlier, he wrote the foreword. So how do, you, how do you secure something like that? I get asked these questions all the time. Now, I told you a creative way to do it when I kicked this thing off when I talked with Jack Canfield. So I told you about the creative way. Basically, we are able to show that Jack's own coach said he should be on my show. And then it was easy to sell Jack being on the show. So um, what I, and there's a, there's a picture of Jack during an interview as well. Uh, so what I would say is, the easy answer is you have to ask. So we had somebody, and I, I won't share his name because I did this recently. And then when I said, he said, you just have to ask and I'll use to say yes. He had people from my network start going to him, asking them, asking him to do endorsements for them. <laughs> so I don't want to overwhelm him or him go, Corey, stop sending people my way. So I'll just say a big name author, almost a hundred million books sold. He said that usually if somebody can corner him at an event or get him somehow an email and they ask him to write an endorsement, he almost always says yes. So it sounds crazy, but the first thing you have to do is ask. The second thing, which is the harder one, is you have to give value first before expecting anything. So give before you ask. So to give you an example, I mentioned the Jack Campbell one, but we had a guy named John Tellerico, who now is business partners with Bob Proctor and Les Brown. Well, John shared on one of our interviews what he did to get basically, uh, I'll call it an audience with Bob Proctor. So this is pretty clever. He um, went to a Bob Proctor, he used to go to Bob Proctor's events. Well, he noticed that Bob always played that song, I Can See Clearly Now, I think it's the song he played, at the events. So he tracked down the original singer who was still alive, he tracked down their family and said, hey, if I pay you guys and pay for a copy of the record and I send you the frame, would you guys be willing to have him sign it saying, here, Bob, thanks for loving my music or something like that. So ultimately what John did is he got it framed signed by the guy who obviously Bob liked because he played his music all the time. And he took that with him on the next trip to Bob's event. And instead of going to Bob and say, here, look what I did for you. He left it at the front desk of the hotel and said, can I leave this for Mr. Mr. Proctor? And what happened was John said, he never talked about it at the whole event. He got home and he said, a couple of days later, he got a call and it was Bob Proctor's son. And he said, dad wants to talk to you and see if we can schedule a call. He's so uh, touched by what you did. Now, to make a long story short, that was what he did without expecting to receive anything. Just thought this would be a cool gesture. And today he's in business with both Les Brown and Bob Proctor. So what did he do? He gave first. And he was creative, which I talked about a minute ago too. So be creative, uh, give first. So find a way that you can give to them. If you have a podcast, bring the influencers on your podcast before you ever ask for a thing in advance. So bring them on the podcast first. Another thing you can do to get on the radar is if you like their work, let's say it's Jack Canfield, Grab the success principles, his book, take uh, photos of your favorite quotes in the book, get 10 days worth, and then start tweeting or whatever platform you want to use, tag him in and say, love Jack Canfield's quote and the success principle about this. And if you do that for 10 days for somebody, there's a pretty good chance you're going to get noticed. And they're going to appreciate that you've been doing that. So it's, and I've done this in the past and it's worked amazingly. So that's another way you can secure big name endorsements. 
And then the last one I would say is leverage. I've talked about it earlier. It's the domino is just realize you just need to knock down the first big domino. So you just need to get that first big interview and then it's easier to go to the next person. So what you want to do when you go to the next person is let's say if it was Jack, I'll use him as the example. Let's say it was Jack. Then what I might want to do is go onto Jack's website and see who endorses Jack and see who gives him testimonials. And then go to those people and say, hey, we had Jack Campfield on the show. The reason you're doing that is because, you know, they obviously are friends with Jack or like Jack because they endorse them. Does that make sense? So you're going to a warm audience because it's somebody you know already knows him. He's somebody who knows that likes him. And so what I'm saying is get the first one on and then go and say, who's the next people in line that I could bring on based on that? The next thing you can do to get big name endorsements, another shortcut, is go on Amazon. A lot of people don't know about this. Best time to get uh, access to somebody is when they have a new book coming out, even big celebrities. So what you want to do is go on Amazon. And I don't have time to go through and show you where this is at on Amazon, but you can, I think if you search it or Google it, you'll find it. But Amazon has a tab that's called coming soon. And they have like the books for the next year and a half that are coming out listed. So for example, I missed this timeline. I wish I wouldn't have, but Matthew McConaughey released a book not that long ago. And yeah, I wish I would have known because when I reached out, they said, oh, Corey, we've hit our, our quota of books, our interviews now. But if I would have seen it on Amazon a year before, I might have Matthew McConaughey on the show. But all you have to do is go on Amazon and they're coming soon and see who has a book coming out because the best time and easiest time to get an audience with somebody is when they have a book coming out. And if you have a show, obviously you have something to give them back. Uh, if you don't have a show, I would say start a Facebook Live. So any, any reason to have some sort of show, even if it's once a month, just so you can reach out and say, hey, I'd love to feature your new book and you on my platform. But this is another way to secure. Now, in this case, you're securing the interview, but then that'll turn into the endorsement later on if they loved your interview. Last one, I think it's the last one I want to share is hunter.io. It's a website where you can go. And I love this site. I, who did I, oh, I just secured an interview with, um, what's her name? Claudia Wells, who played the original Jennifer on Back to the Future. I just secured an interview with her using this system. And so what you do is you can go onto any website. Now it's, it doesn't have listings for all of them. It's probably, it's about 50, 50, but you can go onto websites and let's say it was Grant Cardone. You want it. You can go into websites like Grant Cardone caught not, dot com grantcardone.com take his website and drop it into the little search bar in hunter.io and it'll come back with every email address that's hidden in that website so we're talking emails that aren't even published on the website what it does is it somehow knows any website that's ever been registered it can usually pick them up now i say that it's 50 percent accurate meaning like 50 percent of the time it'll come back and say no results here's why but even if you can get 50 percent of the time you can get uh, i did it for uh, the other guys the wolf of wall street guy and we're talking to him now, and I found it basically just through putting his website into hunter.io. I, I think you get a certain amount of searches for free as well, and then at some point you can pay a little bit. Last one is a uh, thing called contactanycelebrity.com. This one is a pay-to-play. It's, I think, um, I want to say $39 US, but you go on there, and it, it, they promote this, so I know the number. It's over 59,000 celebrity, whether it's business leaders or actors, 59,000 uh, contact infos. You know, the contact information for 59,000 plus celebrities. And a lot of times it's their publicist email, their email, whatever. So contact any celebrity. This is the guy's book. This is the guy who, who runs that page. This is his book. But in terms of the website itself, I think you get a 14-day trial. And you can only use the 14-day trial on one email, by the way, because, you know, people would be just going on for 14 days, getting all the names and leaving. So you can only do it one time. But if you had like five names you wanted to track down, you could go on for 14 days for free at first. But this is another website where you can do those searches. And I'm not gonna bother playing this. Like I said, YouTube, I won't bother coming out of this, but this is a, a video that is basically Lisa Nichols and Les Brown uh, during interviews said some complimentary stuff about me. And I wanted to you know, say, does this add credibility? Which I think you guys probably know it does. We're even using it as the intro for my upcoming boot camp. We're adding not just that, but we have a one and a half minute highlight reel. But again, endorsements are huge. So I've said so many people say they were thinking about signing up for Blue Talks. And they said, did I see that you interviewed Les Brown? And he said something, blah, blah, blah. And that stuck with them. Like it was the credibility boost that gave them the comfort right away. So again, it's worth the effort to get those endorsements. And I'm going to share one more thing here. Okay, one, one more thing I want to share super quick is um, this right here. I wanted to give you guys a gift and feel if the, this will be most applicable for speakers here. Uh, but I put this together, this evaluation form a number of years ago, I bring it to every talk I deliver every live talk and I bring a printed one and I hand it out to everybody there. I usually put it there before they show up under their chair or what have you. 
this one thing, and I'll explain how, why I mean this, is responsible for about 30% of my paid speaking engagements over the last 20 years. Now, when you realize that I charge thousands per talk, you can probably recognize how much money this one evaluation form has helped earn. And why it is, is that question number four, do you know of others, businesses, associations, et cetera, that would benefit from the material presented today? Who might that be? And may we contact you to follow up? So what happens here is if I go deliver a talk, 100 people in the room, usually about 20 will fill this out saying, yeah, you should speak at our event, whatever the event is. And then they'll leave it and then I'll grab it later and then I can follow up later. But that's so much more effective than expecting them to come up afterward because they might be busy, they might have to go back to lunch, there might be a line in front of you. So we always think people will come up if it's a great talk and try to hire us. It doesn't always happen, but this form has helped me not lose those people. So I get, and I give them an incentive. I'll say, hey, if you guys can fill this out uh, and just put your email address on the page and write book beside it, I'll send you a free copy of my award-winning book. And so, of course, I end up having like 95% of the people fill this out. But it's got to be done in person. If you try to get it done digitally later, you'll get less than 5%. I usually get upwards of 90%. So what I'm saying is this is my evaluation form. I hand out after I do a talk. Every talk, as long as it's under a certain number of people, you can't do this with 10,000 people in the room. But as long as it's under a certain amount of people, always do this. And what the gift to you guys is if you want access to this, feel free to send me an email. I'll give you my email address. I can even pop it in. But it's thatspeakerguy at gmail.com. So again, that speaker guy at gmail.com. If you send me an email and tell me you want to copy this, I'm happy to email you copy this. And it's a very, I, I leave it as a basic, this version, so I can send it to people and they can do whatever they want to it. They can put a new logo, they can change the questions, what have you. And I won't go through it all, but there's a lot of other benefits from this from, from this sheet beyond just the, uh, the potential of gigs. For example, one of them is, can we add you to our newsletter? And so I'll walk out of a room with 100 people in the room with 70 of them on my newsletter for the rest of my life, as long as they don't opt in. And that's pretty powerful. So I just wanted to add that. And then I'm going to give you guys a free gift. And then, uh, like I said, I'm happy to answer some questions. But I wanted to tell you guys, I, I mentioned it in passing. I know some people here are going to it anyway. We do have a speaking boot camp coming up at, um, it's actually next Friday to Sunday. So it's all three days. It's, I mean, I, I don't want to go through all the details, but I'll just say that I'm going to be, basically, you're going to walk away from this boot camp knowing how to build a speaking business from scratch. And it's 97 bucks Canadian. So we're talking pretty low cost, uh, but it's three day virtual boot camp, And you can come and go because some people are like, well, I can't, it's no, short notice. So I can only make two days. That's fine. You can come and go. And we're going to send replays out of the main sessions, but I'm going to be um, covering how to use your dip method, your DIP method to uh, craft a talk and, and basically create a world-class talk. I'm going to be talking the spider method, which I just showed in a previous screen, but I decided not to show it here because I'm going to do it at that event. Um, and that one we'll do breakouts. So we're going to have breakouts between every session. There's actually over 250 people paid and registered now. So the networking is going to be off the hook. Um, and then we're going to be, well, let's see, I'm going to be talking about how to get paid to speak. I'm going to be talking about how to land your TEDx talk. Uh, we're going to do a hot or not speaking title. So you can submit your title and see if it's hot or not. People will vote on it. So you'll know whether it's a good title. Uh, we're going to interview Dave Carroll, who has the United Breaks guitar story. 100 million people heard it. Uh, we're going to talk about how to create a signature talk. Kelly Flair is going to talk about how to leverage books for speaking. Alinka Tuscany is going to be talking about how to land a Wall Street Journal USA Today bestseller list. And who I'm missing, Rosalind Fung is going to be talking about how to land your ideal client. And Abe Brown is going to be talking about how to leverage speaking for more coaching clients. So this is all coming up fourth. February 4th to the 6th. Uh, the website right here, I'll put the link in the, um, right in the comments as well. I know obviously it's not kind of hard to write down a link that's that long. So I'll put it in the comments. Um, or you can email me at that same email address I mentioned, that speaker guy at gmail.com if you don't get it from the comments here. And of course I can send you the link. Uh, but I will say the idea is that I wanted to deliver what I wish I would have had when I started. And that's what this event is designed to be. I'm going to be speaking and talking. It's going to feel like a real live event. We're going to air clips of Les Brown, um, uh, who, Shalene Johnson, Lisa Nichols, uh, Kevin Harrington, and who else am I missing? Um, Mark Victor Hansen, revealing their top secrets as well. So you're going to see a lot of stuff that hasn't ever been shown publicly before too. So just wanted to share that. I mean, that took me hopefully one minute and a, and a bit. Uh, so I just want to share that. If that speaks to you, feel free to reach out. And then I want to give you one last gift and then just tackle any questions that anybody has. The one last gift is a free copy of my book of why audio. Uh, it's pretty easy to get. It's at the book of why audio.com. So the book of why audio.com. If you go there and sign up, 
it'll literally redirect you to the audiobook. And then, of course, if you're using your phone or your computer, you can just bookmark it and listen to it at your leisure. Uh, but yeah, so I'd like to give you guys that as well, since I mentioned audiobooks earlier. So in a nutshell, that is uh, basically how do you uh, create that domino effect that I talked about earlier and master it.